Come now to the Word of God, and we are going to be in Romans chapter 12 this morning, talking about community building. And um, I'm very conscious that I think it's natural as pastors, we, you know, we put so much time in crafting sermons and doing all this work, and then we just kind of, oh, you know, we open the book and we read this. This is the important part. I, I hope my sermon can just illumine this into our lives a little bit, but this, this is the stuff. Listen, listen now to the Word of God. I'll begin in verse 9. Let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope, be patient in tribulation, be constant in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice, weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. For by so doing, you will, be, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not, be overcome, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Lord, guide us as we consider your word. Guide our hearts and our minds and our lives as we stand before your word and and seek its work, your work in our lives. Guide my words. Guide all of us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So we've we've started a, a, a new series about Christian practices that... Practices that, that turn our theology into biography, that turn our thoughts into our story, that get our beliefs into our, our hearts and into our hands, into our lives. It, it's moving from believing that God is trustworthy and loving to actually trusting Him. And letting his love transform us at the deepest part of ourselves and and our character. And so we're looking at a few fundamental Christian practices. Our first one last week was we worship God. And, And we'll look at others in coming weeks like being in and meditating upon God's word. But if we, if worship is where Our Christian faith begins and ends in practice all along the way. The biggest part of our lives is our relationships. God uses the people in our lives to affect us and shape us more than anything else, particularly those closest to us. They have the most significant role in making us who we are. And other than God who does most of his work through them. And we, we affect others as well. And this, this passage, it, it lists some of the qualities, the, the characteristics of a uniquely Christian community, a, a Christ-following body of believers. 
Now, all of these commands, they're not in the singular. In this passage, Paul is writing to everyone. He's writing to the whole community of faith. If we lived in the South, it's to y'all. And, and it starts off with the most important and impactful quality, and all of the rest are in support of it. He says, love genuinely. The word is for genuinely is anapokritas. It literally, without hypocrisy, without play acting. You can't fake this love. It's real. Really love. Now, now we have a dog that <laughs> it can't pretend. Uh, his needs and his desires are simple and absolutely visible food and water, exercise and bodily functions, and affection and love. And it's easy to look around at our world and see that virtually everything is about getting those basic needs met. Food and our daily bread and, and the needs of the, our body and the physical, and, and maybe most importantly, loving and being loved. And cultures are, are developed around those needs. And, and how we can best meet them. And, and once we have the physical needs being met, it's all about love. And this love, genuine, real, unfake love. And that love and that longing and search for it, 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 it changes us and it shapes us more than anything else from our childhood and all through life. And this passage is, is full of the qualities of this love. Now, I absolutely can't cover them all in, in one sermon, so I'm going to focus on just a few qualities mentioned here, and we'll see, we'll see the, the family nature of, of the Christian community. We'll see the graciousness of it, and finally, the ultimate source of it as well. First, the family nature of the Christian community. This passage begins with three different Greek words for love. Agape, for, for genuine love, and then there's the command to love one another. And, and it is the word philistorgos. And then the third one is Philadelphia, which is translated in the ESV as brotherly affection. That's why the city of Philadelphia is known as the city of brotherly love. That's literally what it means. Philos is at the beginning of those latter two words, and it is another word for love. But I want to highlight the addition to that first use, philostorgos. C.S. Lewis, in his work, The Four Loves, highlights this word. If philos is, is friendship, a friendship kind of love, eros is romantic love, agape is, is self-sacrificial love, storgos is, is a natural, deep, just there, no matter what, love. All the other loves have an, an attraction, a pull, a, a strength or demand. Storge, it, it, it doesn't need any of that. It's just the deep connection, no matter what. It's, it's the love of a family. When I was a, a pastor in Buffalo for years, there was a family at the heart of that church, the, the Wagners. And every church has key families, no matter how big those churches are. And... and Heather, some of you know as kind of nearly part of my own family now, is, is the second of the Wagner's four children. And the thing is, watching those, those kids grow up in that family, they could not have been more different from each other than any people I've ever met. Uh, particularly the two youngest, Bethany and Seth. They, they, in their childhood, they only seemed to relate to each other through hate and, and fighting, and it, it seems so bitter at times. And as the four grew into adults, they went their separate ways into computers and film and art and medicine all over the place. 
But now, as grown-ups, they are as close as any family I've ever known. It's that storge love. The church, the church is every different kind of person, connected by one singular shared belief, that Jesus is our saving Lord. And we, through faith in him, are together, the children of God, together heirs of the king, a family. Otherwise, we may have naturally nothing to do with each other, but, but now there is a greater bond. Here's the mark of real Christianity. Everyone is welcome and invited to believe and be part of this family. It's not easy, this family, a lot of squabbles, but everyone, everyone is welcome. There's, there's a famous story of the great biblical commentator, Matthew Henry, and how his parents got together. His father, Philip, was from the lower caste in England in the six, late 1600s, but he fell in love with his wife, who was from the elite upper crust. And when she became a Christian, the, the differences between them no longer mattered to her, and she wanted to marry him. But of course, uh, her parents are not pleased with this and came to her, hey, this Philip, we don't know his parents, we don't know where he's from. And she famously said something along the lines of, I don't know or care where he's from. All that matters to me is I know where he's going. This, this coming together across all the worldly boundaries is the exact opposite trend to our surrounding culture and our world today. It's clear that this, the information age has done two things to us. One, first is we're, we're not that good at being in relationships. We're just not as good as, it, as we used to be because they happen now on, on phones and in the midst of busy schedules and lots and lots and lots of distractions. And as much as it has made being a church hard, even more so, it's made all forms of, of deep and, and truly satisfying relationships hard for our surrounding culture. But secondly, it's also kind of made us gravitate towards siloing ourselves in, in communities in which we feel comfortable. And I, and I have something and, and where we would have something specific in common by which we could relate easily just over those things. But it, it, it doesn't get any deeper than whatever those things are or healthy than whatever those things are. And too often, those things are, are anger and frustration and fear. And this has led, it, led to it being hard to come together across wide spectrums and major boundaries, say, for instance, as a, as a country, over anything. But we in the church... We come together across all the boundaries with true love, with store gay love, and we rejoice with each other in our common hope. We, we cry with each other and bear hardship together, always praying and looking to God together, always sharing our stuff with each other like it's nothing because that's what families do. I have to tell you, I've been blessed this past week. I, I, I'm kind of worn out because I moved this past week. I, I have to tell you a story about Mark and Lori Sabo because they're not here this morning. Um, Veronica and I had gotten to, have gotten to know them and be pretty comfortable with them after regularly enjoying meals at their house in the last year plus. And about a month ago, I found out that I could no longer stay in the place that I'd been blessed to be living in the past year, in the time that I've been here. And the owners are coming back, and they're selling the home, so I had to be out just by the end of the month. And I, 
And just after I found out earlier this month, I, I told the deacons at their last meeting, and Lori leaned over and said, you're staying with us. And Mark helped me move in yesterday. This congregation is, is truly generous, not just to me, but I've seen it all the time. Even just the shoes for Panther Lake. Now, what's happening with a church like us is, is no different than the siloing in the world in one regard. There's one thing, there's one belief that draws us together. But it's different than this. The nature and the character of the one thing that draws us. The love of God in Jesus Christ and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. All depth, all need, all love is satisfied in that which draws us together. But this passage is not just about how we relate to each other as a family. It's about how we as a family also relate with the world. Both of these are where the, the church becomes countercultural, unique. We stand out in, in these ways. There's a word I've read in regard to this section that characterizes the church's relationship with the world beyond it. It is the word graciousness. Here's the question. How are you going to relate to people who don't share your fundamental values and belief? I mean, people not just diverse, but outside the family. Even people antagonistic to your beliefs and values. And, and we do live in an increasingly pluralistic society, particularly in this city. It used to be that everyone from Northern Europe was Lutheran, and they were all going to live in particular neighborhoods. Italians were in other neighborhoods, and they were going to Catholic churches, and Hindus were in India, and Muslims were in Arab countries. Now, all of, all of us, all of these, and so many more, make up the demographics of the streets right outside these doors. And even inside, in here. And, and the most significant singular demographic around us would be progressive secularists. Christians, we're, we're a minority now. And, and sometimes even a look down upon minority. And there's nothing new about that for Christians, just maybe for us. But Paul, he's writing this to Christians in ancient Rome. So I look at this passage calling us to a life of graciousness, even and especially toward those who are persecuting us. And I'd say that if we are living this way, we would be, we would be the people most equipped to live in a pluralistic society, the most equipped that has ever been. In a world that demonizes people that, dis that disagree, we are called to something different. It's not just that we don't seek revenge for the wrongs against us, but we are actually called to bless them, not curse them. It means to wish them well, to truly desire and want the best for everyone, to respect everyone, even to have a genuine love for them. And that doesn't mean that we need to agree with people, but that we will always treat them as people who have real value in the eyes of God and in our eyes too. And if there is a need for real judgment, real justice, we'll set the appropriate boundaries for people's well-being. We'll start with the appropriate worldly authorities if we need to. But finally, we'll, we'll leave all that to God in the end. Until then, the best thing that you can do that could even lead them to see God in you is to value them, to love them. Now, Ultimately, this passage paints a picture of an ideal church, 
a family from all tribes and nations, colors, generations, cultures, bound together by the common experience of salvation in Jesus Christ, and with a heart and grace toward all, even the worst enemies and persecutors. How do we get there? Where, where, where does this come from? What is the source for this depth of character for the Christian community? Because the truth is, when you read the Bible, or, or hear the history of the church, or, or look at the state of the church today, it's, it's more often than not a story of the failure of the family. Now, we don't have to start with church history, whether it's your own history in the church and the hurts you and I have suffered in church, or the whole history of the church, go back to the beginning. Adam blames Eve. Then Cain kills Abel, he, his brother, and it describes the scene as Abel's blood is crying out to God from the ground for, for justice and revenge. And the rest of the family stories are <laughs> just as bad. Uh, Abraham sells his wife so that they won't get killed. Uh, Jacob and Esau, Rachel and Leah, Joseph getting sold by his brothers, David chased first by his father-in-law and then his sons so that they could murder him, and Ammon raping his sister Tamar. Even Jesus tells a story of an older brother's disdain for his wayward younger brother. And even Jesus' own family in Mark 3 doesn't receive him in that, in that moment, and they're against him. And then he says that his real family are those who do the will of his Father in heaven. Bloodlines even fail, but there is a family that can give storge love, that intimate, strong, unconditional, loving relationship. There's another whose blood was spilled by the extended family. Hebrews 12, 24 compares Jesus' blood to that of Abel's. He says that Jesus' blood speaks a better word. It, it, it's not a word of vengeance like Abel's blood. Jesus' blood brings a word of forgiveness, a word of reconciliation, a word of family restored in the deepest form of love. The family is washed in the blood of the Lamb. As a church today, oh, we still divide ourselves up into communities, into, into cultures with which we are comfortable, and by which the, the cultures, the communities that, by which we are formed, and it's, it's visible in this building. There are at least four church services in this building this weekend, and, and they're divided by cultures, not so much theology. And we are... We, in essence, are the church of the American culture, the, the Christian world. Most of us became Christians in a, in a time and place where that was, that was a norm. Everyone believed in God. And as much as we may long for those days, they're, they're not coming back. And that's all right. It didn't exist in the early church or in much of the church around the world. But the church can still thrive. As we're coming toward the tail end of our service, the Ukrainians are meeting in the NPR. Some of them were in here earlier that, to sing with us and worship with us at the beginning. And they gather in a unified, in, they're, they are brought together in unified and deep ways by a common background and a revitalization of faith since the end of the Cold War. And their challenge is not to be seduced by the values of the surrounding culture but to know how to set themselves apart as a, as a, from the world as a healthy body of Christ. And, and we have the groups from Burma and Central America worshiping in the building as well who experience the surrounding culture in a wholly different way and have, have their own challenges. And I love, I love what we have all together. It, it's not always going to be easy living together. It'd be easier if we just live among ourselves. But that's not the nature of the 21st century church. And, and on occasion, we're going to step on each other's toes. And 
We need to try to not always be that big brother who always gets our way because we own the building and, and come from the Christian culture. But I think that our living together is a healthy way to exhibit the kingdom of God in, in that we trust each other as diverse brothers and sisters with very different experiences of the world, but unified by our one common experience of being baptized in the cleansing blood of Jesus. If you remember, this is part of our vision statement as a church in our witness to our community, to share the building with others and the family of faith and to open the doors to the whole community in love and care. But there's another part of our vision statement that this passage speaks into. And it is the challenge for us to, to slowly and lovingly move from a church that primarily emerges from the Christian world to a church that is just as faithfully living in the post-Christian world, reaching and serving and being made up of people from that world who love Jesus. And the passage is the key to how that can happen. We build relationships gospel-centered, store-gay relationships between generations and across various subcultures around us. This is the biggest challenge for the church ahead of us, for this church. It's the central work for the coming season of my ministry and the rest of my time here, and frankly, for the next pastor as well. It's the work of facilitating these relationships, the family. And I'm anxious for the next pastor to get here, not because I want to leave you. I, I love being with you, and I, I just love you guys. But because the programs and the means of, of helping facilitate those relationships across all these boundaries and into a new world, those are primarily going to be the work of the next pastor, building programs and means to engage people in deep gospel-centered relationships with each other. Until then, two things I, I want to do. First of all, is keep the fire burning for this vision. Fan and, and stoke the flames. Keep it in front of us all the time. And part of the way of doing that will be to do a few simple, obvious things that can hopefully help with that. First, I'm, I'm just going to keep talking about it all the time. Also, I, I talked to the session about starting a, a drop-in weekly evening time for anyone who wants to come and, and gather and converse and connect around scripture uh, and, and prayer. Just be together. Be the family together. And instead of me just preaching to everyone, for us to be able to sit down in a setting where we can talk with each other. And, and I'll lead and facilitate the conversation so that we'd have at least one way to get to know each other. And I'll keep you posted when we'll start that. It's probably going to be the week after, the week, not, not the week of Mother's Day, but the week after that. I'll, let me know if that's something that you're interested in. But the heart of all this, the heart of it, the heart of this passage, the heart of the church is relationships, getting to know each other and be family to each other. And if we can keep doing that and growing in it, this church will thrive in the years to come because deep down, everyone wants and needs the store gay love that comes through Christ and that ultimately comes from God. It all comes down to this. God is working in us as churches, as a church, as individuals to build character in us, a character that looks like this passage. And it's not easy, and we do not build this character by looking at the characteristics of storge love and, and just willing it for ourselves. This is how it grows in us. This character grows in us when we look at Jesus, his character and his love for us, and when we rely on that love, then it grows in us, 
and we grow in our love for God, for each other, and for our neighborhood and world. And it happens best when we look and live in it together. Let's pray. Lord, this passage is, is overwhelming when we look at the challenge of having that in our hearts. But Lord, we look to you to help us. We look to each other to find that love and to grow in together. Lord, guide us as, as your family as the family of faith in you. Guide us as all the churches in this building um, seek you. Lord, bless each one. And then, Lord, bless us as we seek to live like this together in such a way that even this community could see it and that we could share that love with this community. And people would come and know you as they see this love in us. Lord, we'll only find it as, we, as you give it to us, as we look to you for it. Lord, thank you for your promise, for your spirit, for your work in us through each other, through your word, through your love, and through your son. We pray this in the blessed name of Jesus. Amen and amen.